History and Freedom by Theodore Adorno. Lecture 6. Conflict and Survival. November 26th, 1964. I have tried to show you something of the negative aspects of the universal as it asserts itself, but as an actual historical process, and if I may put it like this in terms of its logical structure. I then went on, I then went on, I say this so that you can see more or less where we are in these discussions, to show you what might be called the legal title underlying the affirmative construction of history as we find it both in Hegel's logic and the phenomenology of spirit on the one hand and in his philosophy of history on the other. In the process, I have emphasized that the course of the world, to use Hegel's own expression once again, does in fact possess a positive side since it reproduces the life of the totality as a species. It achieves this by joining mankind together in societies that is, in a totality. I have already talked enough about the lethal entanglement involved in this totality, and you will rightly ask me to comment on the relation between these two aspects, for it is strange that, on the one hand, the totality should oppress everything that is beneath it, and potentially, at least, threaten it with destruction, while on the other hand, it is a cohesive force to which society owes its survival. In this connection, let me add that you will find that Marx too approves of this affirm affirmation of the coming together of mankind, as well as the idea that mankind reproduces itself notwithstanding its sacrifices and sufferings. And if we may look for an element of idealism in Marx, an idealist element in the precise philosophical meaning of the word, this would certainly be the place to find the truly affirmative strand in his thought. It is a strand, moreover, that fits with his predominantly optimistic view of history. The form this Hegelian theme takes in Marx is transformed almost out of all recognition, but retains extraordinary power. It is the highly obscure and difficult theory of the so-called law of value. This is the summation of all the social acts taking place through exchange. It is through this process that society maintains itself and, according to Marx, continues to reproduce itself and expand, despite all the catastrophes that may eventuate. I now believe that you are in a position to appreciate the difficulty of this question, which we can describe as the central question of any theory of the philosophy of history. But you can only do so if you take a further dialectical step beyond what I have already told you. Because if we look at the situation with the eyes of common sense, and indeed in accordance with what I have told you so far, it appears as though society is riddled with conflict and hence is rational through and through, but that it nevertheless contrives to survive, though quite how, no one knows. It is very much in the spirit of the famous formula of the invisible hand, the empirical maxim which summed up the English approach to history until the process of integration made it impossible to encapsulate society in a single concept. In my view, the crucial contribution to a theory of history is to be found in the idea that mankind preserves itself, not despite all the irrationalities and conflicts, but by virtue of them. This idea, incidentally, was espoused at least twice before Hegel by the great bourgeois philosophers themselves. We find it first in Hobbes, in whose writings integration and the social contract are brought into being by the plight of individuals who are unable to survive in its absence. It emerges once more in Kant, in his essay on the philosophy of history that I mentioned to you at the start of these lectures, and that you ought all to read if you really wish to understand the concrete context, the philosophical horizon of the problems I am explaining to you. I'll give you the title of Kant's essay once again. It is the idea for a universal history with a cosmopolitan purpose. So what I wish to say is that society, the totality, does not simply survive despite conflict, but because of it. You will, you will best be able to understand this, perhaps if you reflect that in the developed bourgeois society, all life is dominated 
by the principle of exchange, and at the same time by the necessity, which is imposed on the many individuals, of securing for oneself as large a portion as possible of the social product in the course of this struggle of all against all. But, and this is something that was understood quite clearly by the old liberal theory of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, thanks to this antagonism, thanks to this conflict of interests, the machinery of society does in fact succeed in maintaining itself. This is to be understood in the sense that use values are produced not to satisfy human needs, but for profit. I do not wish to involve myself in lengthy explanations of Marx's theory, and so we'll just say that by use values I mean the satisfaction of needs, either natural needs or, as is almost universally the case, needs as mediated history or historically. The only reason why goods are produced is so that the producers, by which I mean those who control the means of production, should be able as a class to profit from them as much as possible. This of course is what sets up the principle of conflict between those who pocket the proceeds and those from whom the profit is made in the final analysis, and who therefore miss out on it. But the life of human beings is reproduced only by going through this process which contains the conflict, the class relationship within itself. Down to the present day, life has succeeded in perpetuating itself only because of this division in society, because a number of people in control confront others who have been separated from the means of production. And given this reality, the needs of human beings, the satisfaction of human beings, is never more than a sideshow, and in great measure no more than ideology. If it is said that everything exists only for human beings, it sounds hollow because in reality production is for profit and people are planned in as consumers from the outset. In short, it sounds hollow because of this built-in conflict. If it is now asserted that this fact and this entire argument is all wrong and superfluous, that life would go on without it, the Hegels and, to some extent, as far as the construction of the past is concerned, even the Marxes and Engels will retort the possibility, the world as we might imagine it, that is all very fine, but this is the reality. Without that reality, that is to say, the reality of a class society that stands as the very principle of bourgeois society, there would have been neither the huge population increase that we have seen, nor the growth in transport, nor would there ever have been anything like enough by way of food supplies for the population. It will not have escaped your attention that the starting point of a critique of this entire way of seeing is the idea, one that Hegel pursued with a special rigor right on into the heart of his logic, that from the outset reality is given precedence over possibility. And of course it is here that we see that unquestioned parti pre for the prevailing universal of which I have already spoken at some length. To recapitulate, then, the fact is that mankind has survived not just in spite of, in spite of, but because of conflict. And this fact has such weighty consequences for the theory of history because Hegel has inferred from it with a very great semblance of justice, a semblance of justice that cannot be dismissed out of hand, that categorically, in terms of the idea, when looked at from above, life can be reproduced only by virtue of conflict. And this has resulted in what might be termed the theodicy of conflict. Thus, it may be claimed that Hegel's logic amounts to the assertion that the world spirit or the absolute is the quint essence of all finite ephemeral forms of conflict of all negativities the positive is the quintessence of all negativities if that be so then this thesis which at first sight may seem utterly arrogant and preposterous may be seen to have its foundation in the fact that the world has survived precisely because of this negativity in other words because society has been essentially conflict ridden down to this very day we can trace this tradition of conflict back to the most abstract ideas of unity, totality, and even reason. And this is something I shall return to. This is why it is so vital for us to understand it. And this may enable you to see why the idealist form of dialectics was not so completely unworldly as all that, but that within the general process of idealization, it also expressed something real that the theory of history cannot afford to ignore.
the same time, the moment this realistic element is accepted, it becomes an affirmation that simply reinforces the negative, destructive side of society. Now it is an open question, and one that I shall make no attempt to answer today, whether or not the human race could only have been perpetuated by means of conflict, whether conflict was historically an absolute necessity. In other words, does it make any sense at all to conceive of a course of history that does not involve this conflict? The most powerful evidence that things could not have been otherwise is to be seen in mankind's commerce with physical nature. For nature began by inserting humanity into a situation of lack, where people had too little, and it was only with the aid of those particular forms of organization that it was possible to cope with the situation. They could not have done so without the relations of domination that forced people to come to terms with shortages and to make them good. This was the factor that made conflict inevitable. Marx and Engels, and especially Engels, who devoted a lot of attention to this matter, gave the problem a highly idealist turn by providing a positive answer to the question of what we can only call the, the metaphysical necessity, the absolute necess necessity of conflict in the course of history. This takes a specific form in Marx and Engels, in particular in the argument they advanced very emphatically that domination, social domination, was a function of the economy, in other words, of the life process, the reproduction of life itself, and not the other way around. It will surprise you to hear that I have picked out this argument among all others to call idealist, but I believe that a very little reflection will show you just how idealist it is. For if history derives its antagonistic character from the economy from the outset, that is to say, from the need for life to preserve itself, then at least in retrospect, social conflict is in a sense as legitimate as historical negativity is in Hegel's metaphysical logic. If, on the other hand, economic conditions and economic conflicts were themselves the product of a fundamental form of domination, then their necessity would be extraneous to the historical totality the life process of society. They would be mere accidents, things that could easily be dismissed as inessential in principle. Now, ladies and gentlemen, it is hardly possible to reconstruct the primitive conditions that from the object of this that form the object of this dispute. If there are any ethnologists and anthropologists among you, you will know how your disciplines have brought in an infinitely complex body of knowledge to bear on these questions, to the point indeed where simple answers have to be ruled out. For example, I may remind you of all the research that has led scholars to derive the original structures of society neither from power relations nor from economic conditions, but instead from magical and religious practices. Admittedly, we must add that such explanations leave the question of the relationship between those practices and the nature of society open and so far as I can see, unanswered. The chief sources of these controversies, by the way, are Engels's anti during and his The Origin of the Family. You can also find a lot of important material in Marx, in the great preface to the critique of political economy, which is one of the, what should I call it, chief theoretical sources for dialectical materialism. What moved them to grapple with this prehistorical problem, which must always remain something of a puzzle, was certainly not to provide a realistic picture of primitive society. And in general, the question of how things were in the beginning is a matter of indifference when seeking a solution to the pressing social problems of the present. It is merely one of the shibboleths of the traditional philosophy of history that I would invite you to think about critically. The fact is that people tend to regard what is older and pristine as somehow better because it comes from the inner nature of man, whereas any casual glance at the wretched existence of primitive peoples who have survived but who still live in Stone Age conditions ought to persuade us to abandon every such idealization of primeval society once and for all. But as I have said, the interest of Marx and Engels in this question, which may appear somewhat pointless to you, was really quite different. The reason why they place such enormous weight on the idea that the origins of conflict are to be found in the economy and in the historically necessary structure of human relations of production, rather than in power relations, 
was that otherwise their own point of view might have led them to believe that, in analogy to those mythical and legendary conditions of primitive society, it would only have been necessary to alter the existing power relations to bring about a rational society without taking economic conditions into account. Thus, the interest in such questions is not in the nature of origins, despite what the title of Engels' book might lead us to suppose, but in highly topical political issues. This becomes clear if you look closely at the debates between a strictly economics-based communism, as taught by Marx and Engels and anarchism, which at that time was an extremely important competitor if I can put it in such vulgar terms. Anarchism was highly influential, particularly in its impact on the masses, and in many different countries such as Spain and Italy, and has remained influential right down to the threshold of our own age. So whoever regards power relations as primary and who therefore wish to alter those relations would be driven automatically to the anarchist side in this debate, whereas the socialists wanted to bring about changes in the economy. The changes they wished to introduce all lay in the direction taken by the economy itself, that is to say, the direction of increasing rationalization, planning, and the concentration of the economy. I should like to take this opportunity to tell you that if you are seriously interested in socialist writings on the philosophy of history, you will not be able to comprehend them properly if you treat them as a kind of contemplative theorizing about history understandable as this would be, looking at them from our own situation. In this respect, they differ from the reflections on the philosophy of history that I have been presenting you with. There is a structural distinction here whose importance cannot be overestimated. The driving motif of the socialist way of thinking about history was the idea that the revolution is just around the corner, that it can break out at any moment and that therefore everything, the entire construction of history included, should be interpreted res retrospectively in terms of the requirements of the impending revolutionary situation. And since these thinkers were convinced, and rightly so, no doubt, of the profound historical impotence of anarchism, they pursued the traces of anarchist thinking back into the dim and distant past, and they did so with a relentless rigor that makes one shudder all the more so since we now know how this aspect of socialism later developed. At all events, we cannot simply dismiss the idea that history begins with a catastrophe of some kind, thanks to which this element of domination made its entrance, and this idea is not so very different from the view co contemporary psychologists have of primal events that are to be constructed on the basis of unconscious memories. If in fact history turns out to be a permanent catastrophe, then we cannot simply reject the conjecture that something terrible must have happened to mankind right at the start, or at the time when mankind was becoming itself, and that this terrible event is like those that have been handed down to us in the myths about original sin, and similar stories in which the origins of mankind and the growth of reason are associated with some disaster from the remote past. However, I leave such conjectures to your imagination at all events, or at all events, these are the themes that I have been trying to explore today, themes that put any aspiring social critique into such a weak position. Its position is weak not only because existing society can confront any criticism with its own power and glory, but also because it can be pointed out that there could be no possibility even of something different and better that is, of a rationally organized society, without a means, ends rationality, or a means ends rationality with its domination of nature. And it is precisely that means ends rationality whose world historical consequence has been all those disasters whose memory has been repressed or eradicated to a simply unimaginable, de unimaginable degree by the victorious powers of history. Only an actually achieved identity could lead to the reconciliation of opposing interests, and not simply the comforting thought that the quintessence of all conflicts would, by making life possible, permit something like reconciliation among all mankind, namely their continued existence. And never can reconciliation be the merely asserted reconciliation brought about by the violence towards everything subsumed under it. To sum it up in a rather bolder way, an achieved identity, in other words, the elimination of conflict, 
the reconciliation of all those who are opposed to one another, because their interests are irreconcilable, and achieved identity does not mean the identity of all as subsumed beneath a totality, a concept, an integrated society. A truly achieved identity would not have to be the consciousness of non-identity, or more accurately, accurately perhaps, it would have to be the creation of a reconciled non-identity, much as we find in the utopia conceived by Holderlin, though to a degree that has been exaggerated by the current state of research in Holderlin's studies. This is perhaps the point at which I might usefully say something about the twin concepts of conformism and non-conformism. This pair of concepts is based on our extraordinarily difficult relation to a course of the world to which we owe everything, and then yet threatens to bury us all. I believe that in the present intellectual climate in Germany, the concept of nonconformism is subject to a degree of defamation. It should be defended against cheap criticism. I regard myself as especially obligated to engage in this defense, because many years ago, in a rather different situation, I published a piece in my Minima Mora Moralia, which I would not wish to disown and still stand by today, in which I gave a fairly detailed account of the conformism of the nonconformists. It does me no credit, though it probably does no credit to anyone else either, that it was this passage from Minima Moralia that was singled out for praise. It is easy to draw a parallel with all those people whose only knowledge of Marx is that he once wrote somewhere that he was no Marxist. However that may be, in the present context, conformism would be either the assertion, not the explicit assertion, but the assertion implied in the objective spirit of the age, in its language, its mental household, that the reconciliation that has not been achieved really has been achieved, or on the other hand, to deny the possibility of that reconciliation at all. These two ideas, that we already find ourselves living in a utopia, and that no utopia is possible or even desirable, and that it should not exist, these two incompatible ideas actually coexist peacefully together. The two together really express the idea that we have been discussing in this lecture, namely that, on the one hand, society only survives because of the conflicts it contains, which is then expressed in the affirmative doctrine that all is right with the world, on the other hand, despite this, people experience the present unreconciled conditions, and this comes to be expressed as a denial of the possibility of reconciliation in general. Needless to say, if you say of an unreconciled situation that reconciliation has taken place, this torpedoes the possibility of a true reconciliation in the future, since it undermines the very people who wish to bring about the very state of affairs that is supposed to exist. <laughs> Oh, sorry. That is supposed to exist and makes them look like fools or rogues. The alleged conformism of the nonconformists, that is to say, the way countless nonconformists seem to display the same stereotyped thinking as you heard described yesterday in the lecture given by my friend Hans Magnus Enzensberger, who subjected this phenomenon to very incisive and legitimate criticism criticism that I would wish in no way to soften or qualify, this nonconformist conformism is in great measure only a reaction to the prevailing conformism. By this I mean the general situation which is characterized by compartmentalism, rigid categorization, and stereotypes coming from above. It is in general a situation that necessarily rubs off on those who resist it. The overwhelming power of rigid categories the static, rigid categories of the universal that confront the critical mind forces the critics to take on something of their rigidity, even if only so as to describe them in the course of asserting their own position. This is to say nothing of the fact that we all live in bourgeois society and therefore, even if we are not conscious of the fact and do not realize just how deeply it has penetrated into the darkest recesses of our souls, even when we disagree, we remain the children of the condition that we oppose and carry endless baggage around with us, which we then reproduce, all unbeknown to ourselves. In this sense, the nonconformists who are so criticized and derided today, and who of course think it a sin to be pinned down 
to a fixed label or concept. In actual fact, we can speak only of conformism. Nonconformism is a contradictio in adjecto, would be justified in invoking the famous Brechtian plea for forbearance on behalf of nonconformism. From what we might call a kind of perverse gratitude, the prevailing conformism confuses the grinding reproduction of life, which after all keeps us all alive, with the possibility of shaping life in a way that would genuinely be achievable today, given the advanced state of the forces of production and of human rationality. And this confusion is what marks the gap between conformism and nonconformism. Thus, it is not a matter of the formal fact of agreement or disagreement with a given state of society. What is crucial is this substantive factor. Are you prepared constantly to let your experience be guided by the concrete possibilities available in the present, in every respect, or are you not? That is to say, have you capitulated in favor of worshipping whatever happens to be the case? In comparison with this issue, it is hard to make significant distinctions at the level of substance, to separate the sheep from the goats, and to say this is conformist and that is, con is, that is non-conformist. I may mention the case of Max Stirner in this context. Subjectively and in terms of his situation in the immediate social conflicts of his day, he was initially a non-conformist. His own theory, however, the theodicy of absolute individuality was conformist. This can be contrasted with works of art that refuse to take up any so-called concrete position with regard to current social questions, works that are not what we can call committed to take up Enzinsberger's argument, and from which it is not possible to deduce any immediate forms of action. Such works, therefore, cannot be described as nonconformist, but from the way they conduct themselves with regard to existing reality, they must be described as nonconformist. Such a person is Samuel Beckett, of whom Enzinsberger also made mention in his lecture yesterday. Conformism and its opposite nonconformism belong to the categories of consciousness or of attitude, subjective categories that are falsified the moment they are isolated, torn from the totality, taken abstractly, independently of the historical moment and the function and constellation of individual motifs in a specific situation. I believe that in general this is something we can learn from dialectics, namely that there is no category, no concept, no theory even, however true, that is immune to the danger of becoming false, and even ideological in the constellation that it enters into, it, into in practice. Normally I am very critical of the entire concept of ideology, but if it has any truth, it lies in the suspicion that, precisely because spirit is in general dependent on the course of the world, and its constellations. No isolated instance of spirit, no embodiment of spirit that sets out to oppose the course of the world can be true or false in and for itself, or rather independently of its relation to that reality.